I'm not as good as he is. Um, this talk is also not one of those make you feel a certain thing inside talks. In fact, this is the closest thing I have to a slide. This entire talk is a demo. I am going to show you the tools that I use to find vulnerabilities in Android applications. But I'm going to give you a little bit of history first. How many people here have heard me speak before? I've never been to this con. Like, no one here has heard me speak. This is insane. OK, I guess I should have gotten out my demos. Well, I know Wolf's heard me speak, but he doesn't ever raise his hand. So, um, so my name is Bill Semph, and I'm a developer out of Columbus, Ohio. Um, I have been in the computer game for so long that my first 30 or so programs were an assembler. I, my first significant hack was teaching an Apple IIe to use two modems so that I could dial into two BBSs at the same time between the time I got home from school and my parents got home from work so I could download more stuff, which engendered me the handle Hydra, which I still carry to this day because I have heads everywhere. Um, I have done just about everything in, in, in the computer industry, but I ended up in software development for some reason. Um, and I think it's largely because I'm really good at translating business requirements into um, working processes. And I'm a good technologist. And those two things go really well together to be in enterprise software development. But I get bored super easily. So I got a reputation for being the person who handles the problems that nobody else wants to do, which is traditionally performance, integration, and security. Are there any programmers in the room, people who check out code in the morning, check it out, check it in the evening, that's it? Oh, just a handful of you. Okay, this is going to be interesting then. Um, <clears throat> so for, for 25 years, I wrote code for a living. Um, and, and that's a bit of an exaggeration because I'm still, well, I'm kind of writing code for a living now. Um, but about five years ago, I was writing, eh, about eight years ago now, I was writing primarily JavaScript code for a living. After that, I never wanted to write another line of code again. So I reached out to a friend of mine and said, dude, find me something to do in the security industry because I've been the security guy on the dev team for so long. Maybe I can be the dev guy on the security team for a while. And he hooked me up with a company um, who had some projects, but they required me to move which, to, to go on site, which I couldn't do at the time. So I ended up doing, uh, he said, well, I'd really like to work with you. Could you do some testing for me? And you know, I'm, I'm a dev, right? I'm thinking, like QA, like write unit tests? What are you talking about here? He's like, no, no, do security assessment. I didn't even know it was a thing. I'd been doing it all along. I, I used Peros Proxy 15, 20 years ago. I learned to use Zap. I, uh, I had a burp license. I'd been testing software all along. I didn't know that there was a formal process for vulnerability analysis at that time. So I learned it. And um, I ended up, I'm kind of good at it. Because as it turns out, if you've made all the mistakes in software engineering, it's really easy to find them. And oh my, have I made all of them. Um, in fact, what got me into security was a SQL injection vulnerability on a website that I had written allowed a bunch of German hackers to take over my buddy's web server and fill it full of German porn. When the hard drive filled up, I got a page at like 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, ended up spending the rest of the weekend in his basement uh, rebuilding the server from scratch. Um, that was an interesting weekend. But I wanted to know how they'd gotten in. This was in 97, by the way, so this was very early on. Does anybody know when SQL injection was invented or discovered? A year? Anybody? You got to know. No. 74 on a, on a VMS. Mm -hmm. um, 74 is how long SQL injection's been around. Anyway, so fast forward a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm testing applications, which is, is, I mean, for a developer, if I can't get a, a piece of code to work, I end up staying up all night to fix it so that I can do deployment the next day, right? In a vulnerability analysis, if I can't get something to, uh, if I can't get something to pop, it just doesn't go in the report. It's a way better way to live your life. So I'm, I'm very happy there. But about, about oh, I guess two years ago now, um, somebody called and said, hey, can you test a mobile application? I was like, I don't know. I guess I can give it a shot. Um, why don't you send it over and I'll give it a try? And I took a little extra time 
and learned some stuff and found out there really wasn't much of a tool set out there to do mobile testing and not many people, there weren't a lot of people with the requisite combination of skills. And I've done some mobile development um, and I'm familiar with Java. So on the Android side, I was very comfortable. iOS was significantly more difficult. I'm going to do this talk in iOS next year if everything goes well. Um, but on the Android side, I, I, I had I had a very strong understanding of the underlying operating system for Android, which is Linux. Um, I have a very strong understanding of the software platform that's used to develop Android applications, uh, which is Java uh, with, with Dalvik. And um, I had a, uh, a strong understanding of application vulnerability analysis. So those three things combined together made it so that I actually did an okay job at this. Um, but there's still, I mean, there, there are some things out there, but there aren't nearly as many um, full range guidance on how to get kicked off because the environment is everything. Uh, there's lots of things written down. There's more tools now than there used to be. But really, how the heck do you get started? And that's, that's where this talk came from. This, this, I'm going to show you all the stuff that I use to make this even possible. Um, and hopefully, it will make a little bit of sense. So my name is Bill Stemp. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, I like Twitter a lot. I was an IRC person for years and years and still am actually on IRC a lot. If any of you hang out on, on MySec, the, the uh, IRC channel on Freenode or wherever it is, um, I hang out there. Um, and, um, but I like Twitter because it's, it's it lower barrier to entry, so the conversation is a little bit more global. Um, you feel free to find me there. Ask me any questions anytime about anything security related you'd like. So this, when I say there's no slides, I'm not kidding. I literally have a, um, I literally have a text file with my outline of everything I'm going to talk about. So first, let's talk about mobile vulnerabilities for, for a few minutes. Um, there is a project of an organization called OWASP, which was during Kevin's talk. You know, he mentioned he's heavily involved in OWASP. I'm sure some other people have mentioned it here. It's the Open, App, Open Web Application Security Project. Mobile applications are not web applications. They are different. But they have a couple of similarities, um, the primary one being that the middle tier of 99% of mobile applications are web services, either XML, SOAP web services, or REST and in, 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 in JSON web services, um, which are hosted on web services and have all the same vulnerabilities as web applications. Um, OWASP has a series of projects that they manage, that some of which are documentation projects and some of which are code projects. We're actually going to use several of them today. And one of the projects is very famous. It's the OWASP Top 10. The OWASP Top 10 is a marketing piece. It is a, something that you as a security professional can wave under the nose of your C-level staff and say, these things are very important. We need to teach our developers about them. Now, it is not an application and security program, and you can't build anything with it, but you can explain things with it. The mobile Top 10 does a pretty good job of doing exactly that. So we're looking for, we're looking to start with these 10 things and then go from there. So what are the 10 things? Interestingly enough, the first of the 10 things is actually um, not a mobile application bit at all. It's entirely about uh, the server side, weak server side controls. So those services which do very well f fall into the OWASP banner are num number one on the list, absolutely. Insecure data storage is M2, and that's referring to keeping secrets on the device. Now, there are secrets and there are secrets. Is the user's social security number a secret? Absolutely. Is it potentially acceptable to store that on their device? Well, it's their device. If somebody has stolen the device, you know, all bets are off anyway. I'm sure that their social security number or other numbers that are important are stored in other data mechanisms anyway. But your server's private SSH key, for instance, uh, is not something that should be stored on the device. The passwords or keys for licensed services that the application uses should not be stored on the device without proper, without proper um, in, uh, encryption or other protection. So that's insecure data storage. Insufficient transport layer protection is once again a server side piece. This is communicating back to the, um, back to the server, back to the mothership not using TLS, which at this point I think we all know that no application communicating over the internet should do it without the benefits of TLS. 
Uh, M4 is unintended data leakage. So this is leaving data someplace it shouldn't be. Not necessarily secrets, but data that isn't related directly to the, the person who is using the application at hand being leaked to them. Poor authorization and authentication is M5. The most common flaw I find in mobile applications, bar none, is um, putting in my username and omitting the password and pressing submit and being allowed into an application. If I put in the wrong password, I get an error. But if I put in no password, it lets me in. This is due to a fluke in some very common template code that people use for login pages for Android applications. Um, and there's just a very convoluted exception management um, example floating around somewhere in, in, the, in Google's documentation that people regularly copy and paste. And if you implement it without changing it, it will allow you to log in without any password at all. I don't know if that one sample is the the reason that this is M5 or not, but nonetheless it's M5. M6 is broken cryptography. This goes on both sides of cryptography, both using inappropriate ciphers for um, symmetric or in, uh, asymmetric encryption, right, either via TLS or storing uh, data on the device, and also weak hashes, you know, using MD5 hash or something of that nature to um, the, ha hash something like, for instance, a session that may present collisions. Uh, so client-side injection is M7. This is basically the exactly the same kind of injection you would expect talking about on a web application, um, either a, some nature of cross-site scripting or command injection. Um, security decisions via untrusted inputs. So you're using the headers of the service call to make a security decision. Whereas, as I will show you, the attacker is not actually going to be using the mobile device to attack your services, so that is a bad idea. Um, M9 is improper session handling. It's exactly what you would expect, um, using, using the user's ID as, as session management instead of a cryptographically random, um, unique session identifier. And M10 is really the only thing on here that's very much specific to mobile devices, which is lack of binary protections. So this is the mobile application itself not protecting itself against reverse engineering, modification, and redeployment. So that's the mobile top 10. And this is about as close as we get to guidance for testing. There is also um, a cheat sheet for both Android and iOS. There are separate projects on, um, on the OWASP website. And if you have to do mobile application testing, I'd advise looking those up as well. They have more detailed advice, but it's still very scattershot. There isn't a comprehensive test plan really anywhere for mobile. It's a little frustrating. So the first thing you're going to want to do is have some kind of a test device, all right? So in order to make a test environment, you have to recognize that your phone needs to be off limits for a lot of reasons. You need a test phone. The best way to create a test phone is to create a virtual test phone in Android. Remember, we're not even talking about iOS here today. This, this is not possible in iOS. Um, <clears throat> create a virtual device and use a fake Gmail account or Google account to log into it, all right? We are going to do a lot of not so great things to this device. So you do not, you want your account anywhere near it and you do not want any of your personal data on this phone. When we are done with this phone, it is going to be very insecure. So I discovered there is a um, emulator in the Android Developers Toolkit. So if you go get the developer, what the developers use to write the applications, you can press a command key and it will pull up an Android emulator for you. And it is so slow, you can literally go to lunch and wait for it to boot. On my, you know, octo processor, 64 gig of RAM, all SSD, Mondo workstation at home, it takes it like 18 minutes to fully start. So there's a solution. It's called Motion. JennyMotion is a wonderful tool built on VirtualBox, which is an open source Sun product, or used to be a Sun product, I'm not sure if it still is. Um, and 
they have a bunch of pre-unlocked bootloader sample um, ROMs for phones that you can just do. There they are. So here they are. Different versions of Android, different devices. These are the actual ROMs unlocked. So you can root them, right, um, and then install things that would get under the covers of the operating system normally. Rooting a phone and unlocking it is not something I recommend doing to your day-to-day -day device. It makes it more vulnerable to both malware and flaws in the operating system because updates are less likely to take even if you do manually run them. Uh, that's another reason why we use a virtual device for the majority of our testing. Jenny Motion is great for this. So we have a Nexus 5 here oops, that we've booted up and it's just a normal phone. It does everything that a phone does. Um, it has all the same settings files. This is a Surface Book, so I have a touch screen. I can actually use the touch, which is really nice. Um, on my main workstation at home, I have three monitors. My left-hand monitor is the touch screen. So I boot it up in there, and I can actually use the, the, the uh, gestures, which is excellent. If you have a way you can do that, I strongly recommend it. It's, it's way nice. So what we're going to do, when you, when you boot up an image like this, um, it automatically sets up your, um, your, your, your Wi-Fi as a wired Wi-Fi. It's very strange. But it reacts just the same as a normal wireless connection. So we can, for instance, go in here and modify the network so that we can use a proxy. And the reason we're going to do this is we're going to proxy all of our traffic through an attack proxy. In this case, Burp Suite. You could also use Zap um, if you prefer, Z Attack Proxy, which is the free like beer, open source OWASP project, which I probably really should be demoing instead of Burp when I do this, but I'm so used to doing Burp, I just do it. Uh, <clears throat> maybe if we have time, we'll look at that. Um, you can proxy all the traffic through here. So when we go, well, let's do this, let's go. Go back here and we cancel here and we go here. We go here and we load up Hacker News and we refresh. And there's, there's the request and response pair to a Spring Fortress. Here's the request. See, it's just a regular get, and here's the response, all that data in JSON. It's exactly what you would do if you were doing analysis of a web application, right? You go in and you, you use Foxy Proxy or some other add-on for your browser, teach it to use your, um, your, your built-in proxy on your machine, all the web traffic goes between the web browser and the server gets recorded by the attack proxy. Now, I'm not going to do a demonstration of burp here today because that's not the point of all this. If you want to do that, we can do that some other time. Um, but the, the point of all this is M1 because no matter what, and it's true, it's uh, the way I found it as well, most of the vulnerabilities involved in mobile applications are actually found on the server side. So all of the same attacks that you would do to a website using an attack proxy like this, you want to do to their web services. Web services are tricky. They don't respond the same way. They're often stateless. Figuring out where the session management is is sometimes extraordinarily demanding. They don't return HTML to you, so it's very difficult to find things like cross-site scripting. It's not usually um, rendered in a way that's useful. Also, remember, we're rendering on a mobile device, not a web browser. So the ability to inject client-side code is very different. We might not have access to JavaScript. Then again, we might. So it's, it, it's a little bit more involved. It's a little bit more thinky than attacking a web application, in my opinion. Um, but it's absolutely something that should be done. So in order to do this, 
we need to set up a special proxy on burp so that it will listen on any interface. Oh, I'm on my own network up here. But if this were um, if this were open, any of you could use my IP number and proxy through my burp right now, and then your traffic would show up here. Um, the reason we've done that is because if we just do uh, 127.0.0.1, then it, it, it's expecting that everything's going to be resident on the same machine, right? Realistically, that virtual machine is a separate machine with its own IP number. So I need to, unless I'm going to go in and program every device I want to proxy from, I need to just say, listen, accept, accept, all, accept all comers, right, star, accept all interfaces. I'm going to pick a different port number so it doesn't pick up traffic from my local machine where there might be a web browser open with a proxy on it. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, let's go back to the list here and see where we're at. Okay. Uh, so this is why I've got all these notes. There's a lot of details to this. Uh, and this is all up on my blog, too. So you can go remind yourself. And also, it'll be, it'll, Adrian's recording it. So uh, it'll, it'll be up on YouTube probably like in about 20 minutes. I think the last time I gave this talk, he actually had it up on YouTube before I was done with it. I'm still trying to figure that out. I, I'm not certain. Um, <clears throat> if you are on a Windows platform, I didn't give my Windows speech. I'll have to give my Windows speech next. If you're on a Windows platform, remember that the Azure bits, that's not, no, not Azure, uh, Hyper-V. The Hyper-V bits interact poorly. The Hyper-V bits interact poorly with VirtualBox. So if VirtualBox is erroring on you in JennyMotion, so JennyMotion just says, I can't do it, go look at VirtualBox. You open VirtualBox, it's erroring too. Go look at your Hyper-V settings in Windows because every major update, Windows turns them all back on and you need to turn them off. If you're using Hyper-V, you're not going to be able to do both of these at the same time. Secondly, JennyMotion must run on the metal. You cannot set up a VM, install JennyMotion on it, and then run Android apps inside the VM, inside the VM. Um, it, will, it simply will not let you do that, and it tells you that, like line one in the documentation. So everything has to be straight on the metal. Now, you'll notice I'm running Windows 10, and I'm supposedly a security uh, analyst, right? And you know, all security people hate Windows, right? Well, I don't. Um, I was a Unix guy in the day. Um, and I had a Mac on, on uh, System 7. And was when, I, when I really kicked off my, my professional dev career, uh, and I logged into Unix boxes via terminal to, to do my work. But when Windows 95 came out and they um, started to fire up INS, I said, this is going to be the platform for mid-level business, writing intranets, um, which I was doing at the time in Perl. Um, and I said, this is, this is where it's at. This, this mid-level scripting language, something like VBScript, this is where things are going to be at. So I whole hog moved. I, I sold my Mac. I had a buddy of mine build a Windows PC. I became a Windows guy. I went to the Windows 95 launch at OSU. Um, and I've been a Windows guy ever since. So, and I'm a .NET programmer. I, I'm still very much a Windows person. But I really thought this would be better done on Linux. And I have a, a, a on the metal Linux box to do Python coding and whatnot, and it's much easier. And network anal an analysis and stuff like that, software-defined radio, all that stuff's easier on Linux than it is on Windows. But I discovered that despite what some people will tell you, my experience is most of the tools just don't run great on, on Linux. Android Developer Studio, is it available? Yes. Does it run well? Absolutely not. JennyMotion isn't available at all. Um, uh, there's another tool uh, that I'm going to show you later called Virtuous 10 that's a decompiler. And yes, there are other ones that are available for Linux and command line tools and, and you know, why aren't you just using Emacs like a real programmer? Um, but the fact is, is that the, the tools that I'm showing you either work poorly on other operating systems or aren't available at all. So honestly, I'd use a Windows box for this. Um, it's, that's been, it's been my, uh, my thing. Okay. So um, the one other thing I managed to forget to tell you was that you will need to teach your uh, teach your, win, uh, your Android machine to trust Burp's intermediate certificate, which you you can it's it, it's now there's a video of it on 
Port Swigger's website. I will just let you watch that rather than me walking you through it because I always forget where it's at and people in the crowd have to remind me. So I will just tell you, you'll need to do that and it will leave this mark on your machine. Another reason why you should not use your personal uh, Android phone for this. Uh, you, want to, you want to have a test machine. And since we can virtualize, why not, right? And you can have dozens of these too, it's great. And you can kill them and delete them and, and take snapshots and vir virtual box and it's, it's really very cool. Um, actually, I don't take advantage of nearly as many of these things as I did. So um, the one other tidbit is uh, my fake account that I have here is actually I also use for like my social engineering stuff. So it's a it's a real fake account, um, and it's a very very popular word in Gmail. I was one of the first two or three thousand people to get a Gmail address. Um, so, but my last name was gone already. So I got a very common word. And people have used it incorrectly a lot of times. In fact, most commonly, my email is filled up with these banks, bank statements. That there's some something solution. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, there's something similar to my email address that is um, a bank, and people send their financial statements to it. So I have just like hundreds of thousands of financial statements stored in my Gmail account. But also, people send me messages on Google Talk. So if one of that happens, I'm sorry about it. It, it does happen occasionally. Okay. So when you test services, you can exercise the mobile application and then um, test from there. But also, let me recommend another tool to you called SOAP UI. Has anybody ever heard of it? This is a developer's tool. Um, but it is a really, really nice, um, uh, has a very nice project model for certain so it was, apparently it's going to take forever to load for some reason. Oh, it's probably trying to call home. Oh, and it's also a, um, a spring app. So it, is, uh, it doesn't do my scaling very well. Um, so you probably can't see this at all. But you can just go right here and say, I want to make a new REST endpoint. And it will start you with where the endpoint is. And then it will go and do its own research and find whatever it needs to find about the, um, the, the logic that's available. Uh, and then you can proxy this through Burp and exercise the, um, exercise the services even more fully than you can with the application itself. So this is a great way to get one of, some more of those M1 bugs. So one thing I re recommend you do, if you want to take this seriously, is write some code. Learn how to write Android applications. Because one of the core attacks you can do, method swizzling, um, is you can fire up a application, learn how it works, and then change the screens to do what you want to do, and then put the application back on the device, making a, a true, truly like weaponized version of an application to prove the exploit of vulnerability. So I recommend you get Android Studio, what did I do? Move all my stuff around again? Oh, for crying out loud. OK. Anyway, get Android Studio. It is free. Get an Android developer account. It's like 25 bucks a year. And it gives you uh, the ability to write a simple app, get it up in the store, see what it's like, see what that process is like. You have much greater insight into what can go wrong in an application if you know what is possible in an application. So take a weekend. There's tons of beginning uh, pieces out there to teach you how to do this. Write some code and, uh, and, and get started. All right. 25 minutes. I'm three minutes late. <clears throat> Android has a built-in debugger. It's called ADB. Uh, see, time used to, yeah, okay. Um, right? Yeah. When you fire up a Jenny motion, it automatically registers itself with ADB. So we're automatically connected to it with a debugger. I don't remember if the ROMs have debugging turned on automatically. I think they do. Um, if not, you can just go and look and turn them on. So here's what we can do then. 
Now we're logged onto the device. This is the actual machine. I mean, we're logged into, oops, we're logged into this machine at a Linux prompt. So anything that the application stores on the machine, all of our Linux toolset tools are still going to be valid to help us with the analysis. But to be honest with you, more often than not, I just pull things down and use the tool sets I'm familiar with on Windows. But if you're more familiar with Linux, you can get, you can get right in here and do the work on the device at the prompt using a command prompt. Um, absolutely key way to get things done. Um, there is a unusual set of structure of folders in Android that this isn't a forensics course, so I won't get into. I will tell you that most of the application specific information without special privileges, the application can only store its settings and internal bits in, C in, in data data. So here are all the applications that exist on my device. Obviously, most of them are that com.android namespace. Those are Android applications. Um, com.google, obviously, or is the, the Google branded Android applications, because you know that there's, there's Android open source Android, then there's Google's special Android, right? And that's why we have to get ROMs. We can't just download and build and deploy, is because Google's closed a significant amount of the way Android works. And these pieces down here are little bits and pieces of applications that um, that I have installed separately, right? So there's Yapari, for instance, an application that I'm working on right now. So we can log out of this, and then we can use another ADB command called ADB pull. Well, okay, I didn't get anything. But that then, after you've exercised your application, would download all of the settings files and bits and pieces that that application changed for you to go and look for insecure data storage. Dig through. Did it save keys on a machine? Is there a password that it's using to access the services that it's maybe hashing or encrypting locally before it sends through, but it's storing it on the device? Is it storing anything of the users that really shouldn't be left on the device? Maybe something of the users that's related directly to your application? Um, anything that can be used to further an attack? All of those things are pieces we look for by looking in the settings that the application leaves on the device. Now, I'm going to say, there are far more sophisticated ways to get access to the internals of what applications do. There are actual hardware devices that plug into the machines that give you memory level, bit level access to what's going on inside the device. They're also $4,000 a year. Everything I've shown you thus far is free. So, you know, you get what you pay for, and it's true that those tools are very good, but they're probably more than you need for Android assessment. I know they're more than I need for Android assessment, um, for, for vulnerability assessment, and um, they are quite expensive. That said, if you, you, you need that level of access, that's, you can go get it. It does exist. Um, so, yeah, that's true. Um, most of you being security people, you're probably more familiar with the underlying Linux operating system than I am. Um, you probably know interesting places to go look for things as well. Um, one way to do things is just to go get everything before you install the application and go get everything after you install the application and compare the two stacks. Find out what that application changed on the device. I have done that before and found all kinds of interesting things, especially if an application requires a certain privilege from the phone that allows it to save its settings elsewhere or give it more advanced access into the operating system then you're definitely going to want to go dig around and look. But that's a little above what we're trying to do here. Um, pull a copy to the host. Oh, so all of this said, in order to do this, we need to be running this app on our phone to get things rolling. I should have said this before. But in order to do that, you're going to need the APK, right? Um, 
So this is the example APK I'm working with just for messing around here. We don't need that anymore, do we? We don't need him anymore. Um, so to get an APK now is way easier than the first time I built this app or uh, built this presentation. Um, now there's a ton of neat little ways to get an APK that interact directly with the store, and also apps that you can install on your phone that will uh, get the APK for you. Um, and then there's instructions on going and finding on your phone as well and getting it manually, which may require doing some decryption magic and stuff, so I advise you to use the tools that are available. But if you go to the Play Store and search for APK Finder, it'll, it, you can just download an app to your device and it'll, it'll take the APK and put it on the downloads folder. You can log in with ADB and get it to your machine. If you're handed the APK file, okay, say you're doing a Okay, not that any of you do an illegitimate test, but if you're doing a test for like a company, right, where the developers give you their, their hockey account, they, they let, give you access to their hockey account, and you can go download the latest build and test that. You're literally given an APK file. All you need to do is um, uh, download the application and then drag it to the phone, and it will just install. And that's it, and install the app. Um, where is it? Insecure Bank, right here. So that's something super simple that Jenny Motion gives you for free. And that's, so that's how you get the APK and how you put the APK on your device. Now, now that you have the APK, there's other interesting things you can do too. Let's talk a little bit about the PC test environment. Once you have the APK, there are a bunch of scanners out there. And they are, um, some of them are downright neat, um, but none of them are perfect. And people are building new ones all the time. In fact, I've started publishing up some of the scripts that I use into my GitHub in hopes that one day I'll be able to either wrap them into a larger scale active project or roll a project of my own someday. Um, oops, I know my password, my super secret password. My not secure, secure password. What the heck? Wow. That's new. This is my Cali box, right? No, that was, that was the last one. Wow, I've never seen it do this before. I mean, I literally just had it up. Well, it's, that is really secure. Well, you know what? Let's close it. Let's power off the machine, and I'll, it'll be a little bit of a pain, but I'll reboot it. Um, in the meantime, let me, let me restart it. And see, this is, so any other people in here give presentations? And you know how they always say, don't do live demos? And then what fucking idiot am I to go and give a talk that's nothing but one hour long goddamn live demo? I mean, so, but I'm a dev, and this is what I'm used to doing, okay? So this, this is what you get. I do have some boring ones with slides, but nobody likes those. Um, so sometimes things are going to break, and that's just going to be the way it is. I will tell you that, uh, that that worked just perfectly sitting over in Hack for Kids an hour ago. So so let's let that let's let that boot up, and I will show you the other side of my uh, environment. So this is Virtuous Ten Studio. So Virtuous Ten Studio is the Zen reason why, um, in my opinion, most of the Android tools run better on Windows than anything else. Because most of the Android modders out there, the people who make modifications and skins for Android applications, are 14-year-old boys using their mom's old Windows 7 laptop. And I kid you not, that's who originally wrote Virtuous 10. They weren't really 14, but I mean, just two basically kids um, building a tool set to, mod to make mods to Android apps. As it turns out, these tools are awesome for static analysis of the APK files. And I'm not gonna click and show you the reverse generation process, but there is a, um, there's a, uh, a tool out there called APK Tool. It's open source, and it's designed to reverse engineer um, the bytecode of an APK into the intermediate language, which is Somali. Um, 
And that's, uh, that's what Virtuous 10 uses. And you can do it all from the command line and be fancy if you want to. But it is so easy to use Virtuous 10 and actually have an IDE to work with. It's, it's insane. And again, it's free. You can pay for a license. The only thing you get rid of is the little flag at the beginning that says uh, it's there. And actually, I think I, I paid for a license and sent in the form and everything. And I have never heard back from them. So I'm wondering if they just don't care anymore or what the deal is. But uh, it doesn't matter. They're still operating the tools. And that's what matters to me. So once um, something you should know about an Android APK, it's really like all of these um, app type environments. It's just a zip file doesn't matter whether you're talking about an iOS uh, IPA file, uh, APK here, um, a Windows 10 universal application. They're all just zipped. You can change the extension to ZIP, uh, double click on it, it'll open in Windows. And then you can look at the underlying files. In fact, I gave a talk at Black Hat um, several years ago, about, back at Europe, about um, Windows 10 and the vulnerabilities that I discovered doing analysis of Microsoft's Windows 10 apps. For instance, they left all of their, um, it's just JavaScript under the covers, right? And they left all of their uh, keys, like to access their own weather services, their keys are sitting in the JavaScript files. Rather than using HMAC like they should, they just saved the keys in there. Um, and so, I mean, you could use Microsoft's, Microsoft's own key to get weather from Bing in your app if you wanted to. I got a phone call from Microsoft after that talk. That was a little stressful. I was sitting on my deck. It was like 6 o'clock. had a cigar and a scotch. Phone rings. Seattle number. Ah, oh, cool. Maybe, maybe somebody's got some work for me. Answer it. They didn't have work for me. <laughs> <laughs> the most important file in here is the manifest file. The manifest file will tell you all of the privileges the application asks for. Now, this isn't really a security vulnerability per se, but developers will tend to just keep adding privileges to their app until it works and then never take anything away, which is not only very rude, it does set you up for failure. So making sure that these things are actually what the application needs should be one of the things you do. Um, it lists all the activities. These are like, um, these would be pages in a web application, right? Um, you can then find the activities down in the, in the res folder. Um, it lists, um, uh, yeah, that's pretty much all in this one. But there's there's other pieces that are in there that'll it'll list certain assets and, and external pieces, the uh, Android operating system if it needs them, um, and, and other stuff like that. Uh, also, this is often a place where developers will store things like credentials. Um, and, and you need to look for that because that's something you definitely don't want kept on the device because this is obviously something anybody can look at. Then once you get past here, you can do things like we're talking about insecure, secure, insecure um, cryptography, you can go and look at uh, the certificates that are stored with the app to make sure that they meet your organization's requirements for, uh, for encryption. And then, most interestingly, you can start digging into the, um, the activities themselves. The shapes of the activity are all written in XML. And the code behind the activities are originally written in Java. The intermediate byte card code is called Smalley, and it is here. And you can do static analysis of the application in intermediate code. And there are lists of things you can go on the OWASP website. You can find lists of things you can search for that are potentially dangerous if you don't know how the coding platform works. Uh, it'll give you some basic stuff to sit and look for. Um, Oh, and then uh, I didn't keep it up. Uh, let's see here. Nope. No. Uh, just a second. There it is. So I have um, my own framework for pen testing. <coughs> here are some of the pieces that you search for here. Um, and then all the other bits that I, I do search for. Most of this is just out of the OWASP cheat sheet. Um, but these are the things I start with the what, 40 items or so that I check for, that I start with, and then we go from there. Uh, but working in Burp, working in Jetty Motion, working in VirtualBox, and working in the spreadsheet, that's how, that's how I wrap this all together into one piece. Let's see if Callie's up. There we go. 
unfortunately, I had all this preset up, so I'm going to have to remember what I did. So Clark is a scanner written by LinkedIn. It is on um, GitHub, and it's actively maintained, and they take pull requests. Um, I, uh, know one of the, I know two of the guys now. I met one at DerbyCon uh, who wrote it. They're really cool, and they know their stuff. It's written in Python, and it's just an, a, static, a static analyzer. That's all it is. Um, notice that it's Q-A-R-K, not Q-U-A-R-K. That is a very different thing. I only have five minutes left. Um, so you can tell it you have the APK, provide a path where you can pull one off the device. Um, you can say, and this is where I'm going to forget, diva beta dot apk. Oh, jeez. Uh, temp diva beta. Okay. No, okay. I'm not going to go look for it. Um, the uh, and it will just run a static analysis tool. It'll, it'll, it'll run ABK tool, it'll digest the Somali, and it'll sit and run through all the Somali code and look for a set of pre, it's just like any other static scanner, right? It's looking for pre-established patterns that represent vulnerabilities. It'll tell you about things like um, your, uh, your starting activity is unprotected. Therefore, any application can launch this application, which leads to tap tracking. It will tell you about unprotected buttons for, for tap jacking. It will tell you about um, missing cryptography. It will tell you all kinds of cool stuff, and it prints out a really spot-on HTML report that you can include in your final analysis, which is really cool. So uh, I like it a lot. Um, if you want to get involved in this, I think this is a great place to put your code. If you've got an idea about a vulnerability, this would be a great place to put a proof of concept for it. There are others out there. I just don't know them all. So feel free to hit me up on Twitter if you know one. Um, I am running out of time, uh, so I will just tell you one real quick thing about this, um, hopefully. So sometimes you have to have a device, okay? You um, have something that uses the camera, you have something that uses the Bluetooth, you have something that uses the GPS, and you have to have the device itself. Um, let's see if I get connected to it. So there is a build. Um, everybody see that okay? There is a, an Android, a Cyanogen mod uh, version of Kali called NetHunter. And it is a penetration testing toolkit for like doing network pen testing. So you can take the phone in and run your pineapple, uh, well, okay, that's a good point. Um, run, uh, let's see, is NetHunter, is NetHunter, and then, you know, HID attacks, DuckHunter, NMAP scan here, we can do an NMAP scan on the network once we're connected to the Wi-Fi, all those things that you can do, right? But we're not interested in any of this. What's nice about Kali is that it's a very secure platform upon which to put an application on the hardware that we can then go and test. And you can do the same exact thing with this you did with your virtual phone. You can set up the proxy, trust the burp piece, um, and then not use it as your main phone. Gives you a great excuse to buy a gadget too. Fun toy. Um, it works great on the Nexus 4, 5, 6, and 7, but the phone I like the best is the OnePlus One, which is a extraordinarily inexpensive, very high quality phone. It's actually currently in version three. They only have an image for, for uh, one though. Uh, I carry the three. Uh, you can buy a one used for 90 bucks, and it is a great phone still today, even three versions out. Um, but if, if, you, if, you, if you need to test on a device for whatever reason, that's how you go about it. You get a OnePlus One, you install the Kali NetHunter, uh, 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 build of Cyanogen on it, and then you um, do all the same crap to it that you did to your virtual machine. You can still proxy it through Burp, the traffic's still going through Burp, um, and then you can, uh, you, there's all kinds of fun tools that you can use for that. Um, I am out of time. I want to be nice to the next presenter. There's more stuff, but, uh, but we, we go as far as we can. Uh, if anybody has any questions, um, I'm actually largely in Hack for Kids. My son is here. 
Um, and if you don't know Hack for Kids, you should just stop by and see it. They're doing all kinds of stuff. My son took the, spent the morning taking apart an old Toshiba laptop and experimenting with the bits inside of it. I don't even know where that's going to end up. Um, but feel free to find me, uh, ask me any questions, or hit me up on Twitter. Other than that, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your con. Thank you.